We're starting amazingly on time considering the company we're in. Well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We need our best. <laughs> About 20 minutes ago, Jorge said to us, uh, I thought this was starting at four. <laughs> <laughs> I need to take a shower. I was thinking, well, you have time. <laughs> Um, I guess we will begin, yes? That's a, uh, this also you know, speaks to everybody. It's a good opportunity to learn something about something, which is what do we do with stereotypes? Everybody was expecting to start you know, quarter after. Here we are. <laughs> so what do you do now? Sorry. You need to start. <laughs> Bob, are you ready? We're uh, disappointed no, already. <laughs> Uh, welcome, everybody. This uh, is part of the Double Edge Theater Conversation Series. Um, today's conversation is with Jorge Anofri and Carlos Uriona. Uh, we're calling it From the Dirty War and Beyond. Um, this is a huge, incredible uh, topic. I think this, I hope, will be the first of multiple types of conversations like this um, about this period in history, about um, this type of artistic response um, and uh, just a larger, mul complex, uh, multifaceted period of time um, going back uh, about 40 years or, or, and more until today and beyond. <laughs> um, I think I know everyone in the room, but for those of you who I don't know, uh, my name is Matthew Glassman. I'm the executive director of the Double Edge Farm Center and one of the actors in the group, and I'd like to uh, welcome you who are, who are in the room. I'd like to also welcome those of you who are watching online. This is being uh, web streamed live thanks to New Play TV and HowlRound. Um, I'd like to thank HowlRound for doing this. I'd also like to thank the uh, NPN, the National Performance Network, whose grant uh, enabled Double Edge to bring Jorge Anofri to Ashfield from his center in uh, Chipoleti, in the northern part of Patagonia in Argentina. Um, I'd just like to start by um, just saying a little bit about both of you guys, very briefly, um, and then we'll just start this conversation. Um, so first, let me say, Jorge Onofri. Um, and these, the, these, these bios are, are very, um, they're, they're tertiary, they're, they're, they're really just a, a little bit of the work. Both Carlos and Jorge have been working uh, individually um, for somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 years each. Um, so there's a combined 80 years practically of, 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 of work um, between the two of them. Um, Jorge is an actor, a puppeteer, and a teacher. He has worked um, with some of the, the, some some of the, the master of artists. Of, um, um, so, there's so there's a, a combined, combined 80, 80 years, years practically of, of, of of, of work, of work um, between, between the two, the two of, them. of them. Um, um, Jorge, Jorge is, is an actor, actor uh, a puppeteer, and a teacher. teacher, teacher he is, I will not uh, attempt pronounce. pronounce correctly, so I will leave them. Uh, for his work on uh, an incredible uh, adaptation of Strindberg's uh, Ghost Sonata. Um, Jorge, Jorge is an actor, a puppeteer, and a teacher. I will not uh, attempt pronounce correctly, so I will leave them. Uh, for his, his work, work on uh, an incredible, incredible uh, adaptation of Strindberg's Ghost in Adam. Jorge is an actor, a puppeteer, and a teacher. I will not uh, attempt to pronounce correctly, so I will leave them. For his work on an incredible adaptation of Strindberg's Ghost in Adam. Jorge is an actor, a puppeteer, and a teacher. I will not attempt to pronounce correctly, so I will And since 2007, he's been directing La Caja Magica School for Performing Arts. Um, Carlos Uriona, many of you know, uh, here, uh, the ensemble leader of Double Edge, um, the lead actor, uh, um, co creators of, um, of our performance. Since 2007, he's been directing um, La Caja Magica School for Performing Arts. 
Uh, and Carlos, Carlos also from Arcantina, many of you know, uh, actor here, and puppeteer, uh, the and he's been working in Double Edge since '96. Um, um, his before coming to Double Edge in '96, uh, uh, Carlos uh, was the founder of one of the um, most important uh, theater companies in Argentina. Uh, uh, and Carlos is also from Arcantina, um, many of you know, his name, here, actor and puppeteer, uh, the and he's been working in Double Edge since '96. Twentieth century. Um, the, um, the his before coming to Double Edge in '96, Carlos was the founder of one of the most important. Of theater companies in Argentina. Uh, yeah, and Carlos is also so Yona, um, and if you know his name, here, actor and puppeteer, uh, the ensemble leader of Double Edge in the 20th century. Um, by the, um, the his before coming to Double Edge in 96, uh, Carlos was the founder of one of the most um, important theater companies in Argentina. Uh, yeah, and Carlos is also Yona, and if you know his name, here, actor and puppeteer, uh, the ensemble leader of Double Edge in the 20th century. His before coming to Double Edge in 96, Carlos was the founder, founder of one of the most um, important um, lot of theater companies in Argentina. Uh, uh, yeah, and Carlos is also Yona, and if you know his name, actor and puppeteer, uh, the and ensemble leader of Double Edge in the 20th century. Um, um, his before coming to Double Edge in 96, uh, Carlos was the founder of one of the most important theater companies in Argentina. Yeah, and Carlos is also Yona, and if you know his name, actor and puppeteer, the ensemble leader of Double Edge in the 20th century. His before coming to Double Edge in 96, in some ways, we'll begin with the dirty one. Uh, yeah, uh, and also, you know, and if you know his name, just say something about the dirty one. Uh, 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 about it at all. I feel, from my own experience, I, I know very little about it. Um, I've been investigating it through Carlos from our time together over the last many years. Um, and it's also both uh, a confusing history and I think even internally uh, confused in a way. It's, it's hard to wrap your mind around it because there were so many different factions of people, so many different interests that were colliding and mixing. It's hard to keep straight sometimes. So my own uh, giving a background will be, will be quite incomplete and even more dimensional, but just to get us started. Um, the Dirty War was a period of time, uh, a period of state terrorism in Argentina against political dissidents um, with military and security forces conducting urban and rural uh, guerrilla warfare against um, anyone that was close um, to becoming or, or being thought of as a political dissident, a anyone who was believed to be associated with socialism. So socialism. Um, between 1976 and 1983, um, there were between uh, 10 and 30,000 um, people who were uh, believed to have been either killed or disappeared. Uh, disappeared um, is used in quotes often uh, because it is uh, a term where someone was taken uh, for sometimes a period of time, sometimes forever, in which case they, they were never seen again. Um, and what happened to them uh, falls into a few different possible categories. Um, the exact chronology of this period of repression is also hard to trace um, because a lot of this political and civil warfare that was happening began, um, it's even hard to say, going back earlier into the century, but easily into the 60s, if not into the 50s. Or the 30s. Uh, or the 30s. Um, and lastly, why is it called the Dirty War? Um, it was originated by the, the military, uh, which claimed that a war with quote-unquote different methods, including large-scale application of torture and rape, was necessary to maintain social order and eradicate political subversives. Um, and although they said it was their objective to eradicate guerrilla activity because of its threat to the state, it, it was a wide-scale repression on the general population. Um, and it worked, it worked against uh, so-called all sorts of political opposition considered to, to be of a different um, political ideology. Um, so we have a sense of what this uh, historical moment was in a certain period of time. I'd like to now turn the attention to you guys. Um, I, I'm interested to, to start because uh, you both started very early in your, your artistic work as teenagers. Um, but let's just begin with where you both met, uh, even though that's not when you began, but you've, you've known each other a long time. Uh, we met in Buenos Aires in um, 1978, uh, one, hour, one year and a half 
after the militaries take the power. So we were in the middle of this situation, uh, taking, being part of a group of theater that take, uh, was working with this uh, teacher that we remember so well, Alberto Saba. I'm in touch with him again that you are in touch again. So, and, uh, and that was the first contact uh, in a year of terror in Argentina. 78 maybe was the worst moment of this military, how uh, was say? Dictatorship. Um, and, uh, and we were a very happy guys. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> even even if we are living in this terrible situation, we are we. I remember myself, and I remember you and your group and your brother and all these amazing people, like young, enthusiastic, happy guys trying to make theater and art. Uh, even though we we have this situation and this uh, reality that out of these doors were like. <sighs> Terrifying. That was the way we, we met. 1978, how old were you? I was uh, 19. 19. And you were? 22 to 23, I think. Yeah. yeah great. And, and what, were you, what was that meeting like when you met? And describe, describe yourself. He, I remember him open a door. We were downtown in this thing, and and uh, he had long hair, and I did not have this long hair yet. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember that he opened this kind of glass door like that one there, and, uh, and he came in with, what's, what's his name? Hugo. Hugo. With a with Chilean with friend. A Chilean friend. And they both had ponchos, <laughs> <laughs> like real ponchos. From the Andes. From the Andes. From the Andes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> not not oh rain ponchos, God. wool, uh, yeah. indigenous. Vic yeah. Alpaca Indian. or Vicuña yeah. uh, wool. And uh, we immediately he was super excited and started talking. And of course, he was younger, you know, 19, I was 22, I was a senior. And I was trying to, I, I had been already with Alberto because I started with Alberto in the conservatory, yeah. in the National Conservatory, Before. and then joined his school. And then we created a second school with him. What you weren't there in the, in because the we continued afterwards. And, um, and we, you know, a little bit I, I was in charge of doing what interns do now here, you know, talk about what is this, <laughs> right? But he had already a, a, a lot of things that he was doing and he had all this. And I don't know how you perceive me, but I, I do remember clearly that time that you walked in that school. I remember that, I remember that moment. <coughs> But I, when I came to Buenos Aires in 78, I was already playing theater and puppets for a long time because I started when I was 13. And um, I studied in a religious school all my first part of my primary school. And then I moved to this public school with boys and girls and, and a group of theater. And uh, a, a man that was a great, great master, my first teacher in theater, that is Omar Fossati, a great, great master. And uh, we had this experience during five years playing all kind of theater, a lot of physical theater. And uh, at the same time, we start with, with puppets. And uh, we, it was from the beginning of the 70s. It means that when we arrived to the 78, we have already done a lot. Right many performances, many hours rehearsing, and many tours, and many political engagement with different, uh, with different situations, political situations that we were facing every day. So we, as young students, we were very much uh, involved with the, the, the teachers that were fighting for their rights, and. Uh, and that was maybe the worst thing I did because I, I, I was very compromised with this fight. Committed. Committed with, with, this, um, with this, this situation. So it, it gave me a lot of problems, really. What, uh, 
Give me just a little bit about uh, in 1978, let's say, when you uh, met. What was the what was it like outside the doors of the theater? What was the the reality? I think it's good to explain that because, um, um, and there are very interesting movies from South America now that that explain, and they're very graphic in explaining how it felt because I, literally. You walked out the door and you didn't feel anything. Like this, the city looked normal. Mm -hmm. People were walking, working. Things were like, you know, normal. But all of a sudden, a car would come rushing, normally a Ford Falcon. No, that was the, because it was this agreement between the military and Ford, and they got this incredible business that was selling. For, Ford to, to the military yeah. in the yeah. color, in the green color of the military, were made for the military. They would come dashing, not always military inside. There was a mix of, of federal bureau and military and, and a lot of psychopaths that were recruited that we learned afterwards. And they would, like, you know, it happened to me several times, they would grab you by the hair or by the, and pull you down and put the guns in and say, Whoa, yeah, yeah. and sometimes you get kicked and and then they would go, if you were lucky. Or you would be in a bus, and all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, I was coming from work ma many times, and, and you see helicopters and tanks and everything out of the blue. And the, the bus was stopped, and other bus were stopped, and we were lines of workers against a big wall that simulated a fire squad with lights, and you know we were interrogated individually most of the time, and then let go. Like I was lucky, I was always let go. And they're always looking for someone who they were. They're always looking for dissidents or or activists or or socialists. Well, I don't think so. I think that they they were they were looking for to um, to give us terror. Yes. The feeling that we you are not secure, that we have the power and you are not secure. Be careful all the time. You have to be careful. Don't do anything wrong. So it, it does, because it, sudden, it, it, it happened every time suddenly, out of the blue, how you said, from nothing, just because I it remember happens. being walking once in a street in Lomas, which is an outskirts of Buenos Aires, a big town. And w Manuel, my son, was one year old. And we were walking like this, and we were a group. You know, Diablo Mundo was all together. And we knew by then, it was 1980, so we already knew how to behave. And one thing that you needed to do at that time is to deny that you knew anybody in the very first, so to give somebody else time to run. So we were walking and, and from the stores, this is like 8 p.m. and you know, the stores open until nine because it's, you know, summertime and nine, 10. From the stores, people came out with Uzis and machine guns and AK-7s and it's, like, it was an army and there were no cars, there was nothing but them. And all of us, which were just pedestrians and um, shoppers, mm -hmm. you know, like a mall, imagine that all of a sudden from within, it's like a movie, you're surrounded by this. So I just kept walking and hold on to Manuel and I said, you know, this is, I need to go. So I went and my, my, then my wife, she steered clear of me, just in case, and we dissolved the idea that we were a group immediately. My brother was taken that night, and I just left. And I walked, and I walked, and I walked. I remember walking like 30 blocks. And then I called the lawyer, and the lawyer said, don't call anybody. You should not call anybody. Let me handle this. This lawyer was an, an expert in, in detain people. Mm -hmm. uh, let's not do anything. Let's wait. Then I walked around, I went to my mother's house and left the baby with, with my mother. And luckily my brother appeared the next day. But uh, we were like all disbanded and we didn't know where we were. And then we, got, we regroup again afterwards. But that, that's an example. So you're both teenagers or in your late, early 20s. Yeah. Sort of burgeoning artists, rebels of a sort. Um, and there's this... Uh, there's a war happening, but there's a sense of dailiness as well, and it's all mm -hmm. sort of internal. There's a daily way of life, and at the same time, at any moment, there was 
a post finding yourself in a, a true military militaristic war type of mm -hmm. context um, going backwards a little bit you are you're let's say urban in in Buenos Aires and you're in Chipoletti in the country mm -hmm. and somehow you find yourself um, uh, engaging with with puppetry um, how does this happen and, and, and why? Why was it uh, important? Why did it, it call you ultimately? Uh, because uh, we had this theater group in the school. We play theater every day from Monday to Friday and the weekends with performances in the school or outside or touring. And uh, Was this a, a strange thing that this was allowed or that this was... Uh, it started before. So, no, it was not strange that it was allowed. No. Yes, it was allowed. It's just there was, yes. just, it was arts in the schools. Yes, yes, yes. it yes. was. It was the only one experience I know of, uh, at that at that period. It, it was a very special school, a public school that have this teacher uh, making theater with all these students. So it, that that was not usual. But anyway, I had the luck to be there. So I I uh, suddenly a, a weekend came a woman who was a dentist and a puppeteer, an old woman, Berta Finkel is the name, and she also was a, a write books for children. And she came to Cipolletti to make this workshop for us. And we had this amazing weekend with her, with the making puppets, very simple puppets, glove puppets. And she came with all this uh, Texts that she have written about puppets and and and, and uh, theater, small puppet theater pieces, and we discover a new world. It was like to to make our own theater company that we could put in a bag and and travel around and go to these uh, uh, neighborhoods. Uh, neighborhoods and uh, it it was something great for us. And also, for it was great because we could found at that time a theater written for puppets that tell things that we were interested of. I mean, we could find something to say very clear. Right. So it it helped us to prepare a show and go directly to the audience that we wanted to to meet and tell them what we think it, they should hear about life, about our society. And then we start a work to work a lot. So we, we, I went to school just to, to say that I was a good kid and, and uh, the rest of my time was for puppet theater and theater all the time. And was this sort of, was there a revolutionary message? Was there a protest message? Oh, oh yes, of course, of course, of course. So that, that, uh, that, um, was a great experience because we we were for in different places in our city and other cities. We had a, the mother of one of the girls in this group was a, a person that then, after many years and until now, she's fighting for human rights in a way that nobody had done in Argentina. Uh, Noemi Labrune is a great great person, and uh, she helped us a lot to travel and to find a way to move this puppet theater group in the schools, you know, in the countryside. Right. So we made these long tours in the countryside with our guitars singing revolutionary songs and you know, trying to change and move all this situation with a lot of happiness and completely unconscious that we, Naive. in a few years, we will have so many problems as we had. Yeah. Right. We, so were we, we, we were naive. So it's the early to mid 70s. You're a teenager. Uh, You've somehow, because a dentist puppeteer has arrived in your rural town and has inundated you, has immersed yeah. you in a, a nine, almost a daily routine of yeah. play yeah. and artistic exploration. You then have these tools, and you and this group of people start this work in, around the neighborhoods and mm -hmm. around the region, traveling and singing revolutionary songs. Mm -hmm. What was were you, were you nervous? Were you, was it ever? Da did you ever feel there was danger? In no, no, no. At the end, at the, in '75, we start to feel that we we were too much engaged in some things that were could be dangerous. 
because some people start to be missing before, before. before the militaries came. The militaries came the 24th of March of 76. And I knew people that was missing in 74 and 75. People that I knew, I mean, close to us. So that, that was a kind of, whoa, 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 something something's coming. Something very dangerous is coming. We never imagined that was such a big criminal situation that we, we will live after. I mean, for those interested, I, I will propose, I mean, I've, Certainly, I'm not a historian, and I have some, probably some mistakes in the facts, but I was reading, just to refresh my memory on cer certain data, uh, Wikipedia has a pretty good uh, description, but although accurate, taken from National Geographic, is uh, incomplete. So there was, a, there was a situation of war going on before, in Wikipedia, you will read there were all these groups that we had friends in um, terror, uh, what were called terrorist groups. I would call them they were social movements more than terrorist groups that then degenerated into uh, terrorist groups. But to make it short, and then if you want to ask me, I can talk about that or we can look into materials. Um, what is not being told in Wikipedia, unfortunately, is that what brought this situation to the end of the, the, the 60s in the beginning of the 70s. And what brought this situation was an incessant, almost every two or three years, interruption of the constitutional order by the military and by, um, by economic groups, not, all, not always just center in Argentina, although the Argentinian being the, the, the pivot there they were not the um, they, they were not the only ones. Like for instance, the the, the oil corporations were part of the coup d'état against Perón, who many people say he was a dictator, but he was elected every time he got into power, and there was a Congress and there was a, ju a justice system working, which could have been changed in a different way with another election. But there were interruptions also in in liberal governments like Ilia Frondizi. I mean, we can name a, a series of presidents that were deposed by, by the military and who the task from militaries against militaries. Now, I bring this to your attention today because nobody talks of the effect of the interruption of the law. So if over a period of 40, 50 years, you keep interrupting the law and there is no system anymore, people go to the Wild West mentality. And it's like, okay, it's guns. Where can I get the guns? Middle East, I get them. And I defend myself. And that's how we started. So but when we got to 74, the thing was wild. But I, I, in my belief, it was encouraged. And the other thing I want to bring to your attention is the international picture, right? Cuba have had, in 1958, a revolution, successful revolution, and it was part of the Cold War, and there was the ghost that Russia was going to go into Latin America, of course, yes. which is debatable. <coughs> and, and, and in 1962, in the School of the Americas, the doctrine of national security was developed as a response to this ghost. Mm -hmm. And in 1966, our general in command Taking, being trained in West, at West Point in here, went back and took over and created the document. And that's why school. during the 70s we had 10 years or a little more of uh, military yeah. in every country of South America. Yeah. We didn't have one single democratic uh, government. Which is a sign. Now, this is not a conspiracy theory. If, no, if, no, very if, clear. If, if 15 countries in South America, they all have a military dictatorship, there's it's something together there. Yeah, Come on. Of course. Right. Now we have, yes. you can find this information in books, it's everywhere. I mean, it, it was a very clear project for South America and it, and it was, it, it, and we were in some way uh, part of it and, and victims of this because we couldn't right. decide that. We thought that we were doing something to change our reality and we did. 
But at the same time, we were victims of a big, big project on top of us, right. which changed our lives. So you're both at this age and in this context, yeah. in this small local context and in this global context. Mm -hmm. And I just want to try and uh, talk a little bit or hear from you a little bit about, um, you know, you, we talked a little bit about your beginnings, mm -hmm. um, your impulses, and then some of the work that came out of this. Mm -hmm. uh, but so to get back on track here, you were doing this, this work with puppetry and music and theater, traveling around on tour in communities, mm -hmm. and then it started to get a little bit more dangerous and a little bit more yes. perilous. There was yes. uh, some real interruptions that happened, right? And then uh, the, the militaries came and I left the country for one and a half year, traveling with my puppets. I was 17 and I took my puppet theater on my back with a friend of mine, uh, which his father was uh, missing uh, after the, the 24th of March, the day, the, the day that the militaries came, her father was, his father was uh, taken. So we left the country in April and we were traveling in South America in an amazing situation because in every country was the same or worse than in our country. We went to Bolivia and Bolivia was the, the schools didn't want to open the doors because we look strange. We came from Argentina and they supposed that we were terrorists, so it was very difficult. Then we went to Peru and it was almost the same. A, a little softer there because it was a military, but a, a, it was a, a leftist, a leftist uh, in, in, in Peru. Uh, but then... Um, softer, but not. Yeah, softer. Than the others. But it was growing. Also. And uh, and that was a big experience because I could feel in my own experience what what was happening in South America during the 70s. Right. Then I went back in the in the beginning of uh, the middle of 77, and uh, then I was taken by the police, and uh, then I was missing for one week in Chipoleti. in in Neuquén, uh -huh. in the city behind my city. And uh, I was um, very scared, and my mother had the luck to, to find a way to take me from them after a week. And um, then I... So what do you do after a week of being uh, you know, detained and uh, abused, and before that you've been an artist? Where, what's your next stop after that? Did you get the group back together? No, in the beginning I was a month in my house. I, I sent my my brothers to buy cigarettes in near my house. I, I didn't want to go to the to the street, you know. I didn't want to see outside. I was so scared, you know. It was a, a terrible week. It was the worst week in my life. So many many awful things happened in during that week, and uh, uh, I tried to forget. I, I, I tried to not tell anyone. I, I went back home, and my sister, that uh, she was a, something like 24, she said to me, what happened? And I said, nothing, nothing, I'm okay. And we never talk about this again. Never. With her and my brothers and my mother, we never talk. It was like, uh, you have a, a situation. Yeah. You have a situation. Let's continue with our lives. And that was until three years ago, when I was called by, you must help me with this my English today. I'm not, I'm not in a good day for the, English. the Attorney General of Neuquén to testify yeah. in a case of a friend of her, his that disappeared. As this girl that there was a friend and, and disappeared, so he, the Attorney General called him and sat him in a room to say, you're gonna be our witness, one of our witness. So they said, you wanna continue or should I continue? No, you. So they said, they brought these things and they said, do you recognize this person, right? Yes. And all, all of the pictures, off of all of the pictures, he recognized two of them. And, and they looked at each other and they said, well, you're here not because of this case, but we want to talk about your case. And he immediately said, what case? I don't have any case, right? Exactly. 
So they said, no, 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 you do have a case. You were, you were detained. You didn't disappear in the end, but you, nobody knew where you were. And they went back and brought a file this thick with pictures, papers, everything from back then that talked about him. And there was a case that the military had opened against Jorge as a either drug user or drug even pusher, maybe. I, I don't know. Something really. he was not at the time, as a puppeteer. But that was like the, the beginning of the case was to, to justify them because they had a, 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 an askew justice system, a military justice that was imposed over the country. So they would present that to their judges, which were part of the military system, and they would initiate the action, which then would, what they said, this we learn afterwards, is that the action should be cut loose from the command. This is the way they operated. So the, the, new, the, the group that would take him would never respond to a command. That's why they talk about excess and abuses in their defense when the trial happened. In 86, they, they said there were excess and abuses because people would go wild in mm -hmm. repression. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's now Jorge has been is part of the case that the Attorney General of Neuquén is 17 people like Jorge that are alive and, and they can testify against this group of people that are still free, obviously, because if they're trying them, they are free. And he becomes uh, one of the witnesses or the, the evidence, or um, there's a name for that too. Uh, he's a damnified person and um, almost like a class action too. Um, and, but the problem is that four years ago in another suit like that, another a person are disappearing today because these groups continue to, to operate. In a, in a very low profile, profile mm -hmm. they operate. Okay, so we're now at the present because I've yeah. skipped about thirty years of work mm -hmm. and actions and what things time? that have happened. What time is it? Mm -hmm. And no. what I think it's important to know that there's been a lot over the years that mm -hmm. uh, you know. The, let's say that there was, Maybe even though these lines are so blurry, there, there was a return to, mo to democracy in in eighty three. And then years later, there were beginnings to be trials against the people that, uh, the oppressors and, and whatnot. Um, and then those were put down until very recently. So this is, it reaches into the present, and that's important to know. But in 76, you come back from this period, this, this terrible, um, you were taken for a week. And, yeah, and 77. 77. In this period of time, in the mid 70s, you, were not doing protest songs, Carlos. No. You were, you were being called by something else. Yeah, well, the, my beginning is very different from Jorge. I went to a, a preppy English uh, high school. And at age 18, I didn't know what, what, what was I doing. I, had, I was very disconcerted. Somebody, we were in an apartment with somebody and they put a, a, a record. Back then we used records with the needle. And uh, and I lied uh, I lie on, on a bed and I heard like seven or eight times on repeat uh, the dark side of the moon and it blew my mind and I was kind of like that type of guy although everybody thought I was a hippie I wasn't but I was very moved by all these movements and I was very older than Jorge I had witnessed from up from afar Woodstock and I was like very moved by things that were happening in the world but I. Sorry. But, but then uh, I needed to figure out what I was doing and I, I went to different schools and I met these guys that were doing this research on gaucho theater and I joined them. It was a, a group that were graduating from the National Conservatory and with a project called Juan Moreira, which is the major piece, theater piece, epic. Of, about gaucho and... Gauchos are like Argentine cowboys uh, or a, a sort of a rural, an, an old rural culture. Yeah, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, South of Brazil, Paraguay, and a little bit of Bolivia has gauchos who are nomads, basically. They're a mix, um, a, a mix of a native, a born of, of um, 
lives together of, of Spanish descendants and, and Indians, mm -hmm. uh, but they were not accepted by each the, this white civilization or, or their tribes, so they, they were left roaming and their jo main job was to, to herd wild cattle. They were less organized and, and I would say less violent than, than, than cowboys in a way, although they were pretty, they are there, but they were very, very quiet people. And miraculously, by the end of the 19th century, this group of Italians came to South America, first Montevideo and then Buenos Aires, and they brought Comedia del Arte. Mm -hmm. So there was a combination of, this is now, you're being called by um, sort of the, uh, the puppetry and revolutionary song and going to the communities and schools and getting people to, you know, it's a real upfront social change. Mm -hmm. And you're being called by rock and roll, Pink Floyd. Um, you told me before, circus. Circus. Well, this, yeah. And, and gauchos. Yes. Um, and, and inherently to that comedia. Yeah. And Mardi Gras. And Mardi Gras. Yeah. And that's because, was it had to do, was it, uh, did you want mass change? Did you want entertainment? No, was yeah. it about I mean, Woodstock? I, thought, I, I was also inspired or imbued by a spirit of change that I still think it should happen. Uh, and, um, and I thought, uh, or I saw, or maybe because of my, my own proclivity, is to, to, to lean towards, you know, conglomerates of people. I was always organizing in school and, you know, I was an organizer of, you know, agit, right? Agitator. Agitator. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I did always. Still agitating. Still. <laughs> so so <laughs> I, I looked into these things and I thought, you know, what is it that is in, in my culture that relates to Woodstock? And I found this circus theater, gaucho theater, which is circus, circus, gauchos, all together they were in tents, going in tents around the country, and they ended up in 1925 with a performance that gathered 20,000 audience members in a hypodrome. The, the, I think you would rarely see another theater performance in the world that have had that type of uh, convenience. 20,000 people. So I thought, this is what I should do. And that's why I started. So we created a group off of this graduate group from the, the conservator who created a group that was called the Agrupación para el Teatro Rio Platense. Rio de la Plata is a region, it's a river. Teatro Rio Platense is the theater on this region, the Rio de la Plata, which is where Buenos Aires and Montevideo are. And it's all the Pampas, the big Pampas, which is a big plain lands, flat lands, where the, the cattle roams, and this is a ton of... And, uh, and that's what we did. So these two callings are happening, and then it's we're getting a little bit into the 70s now, 77, 78. You've both met. You're both mm -hmm. sort of a bit ramshackle in one way or another, uh, and looking to find out how to... It seems like you're both uh, identifying yourselves as artists, yeah. um, but you couldn't necessarily organize formally and go out and just perform. There mm -hmm. was a... a one way or another, formal or, or informal, there was a repression going on. Yes. Mm -hmm. You needed to find other ways to mm -hmm. make your work mm -hmm. and to make people be together as an audience. Mm -hmm. um, how did you find that way? Can you tell us something, uh, an example of a way that you found performance in this context when it was very dangerous to go out and, and you know, make a performance or perform a protest song or organize a convening of, of sorts? Um, well, I think that Sawa had the, the first thing showing us, mm -hmm. uh, this, this teacher. I've heard uh, a lot about this guy over the years. Uh, if you can just say in one or two sentences um, he, his name and what his Alberto work was. Alberto Sawa was coming from France at the time from studying with Etienne Cru. It's a mime. And he called himself at the time a mime, but I think mime. he does. Mime. Yes. But then he was also, I don't know that, but I think he was an indirect or direct disciple of Augusto Boal, who's very studied in, in this country now. Um, and started creating uh, invisible theater, which were, he started with things at the, uh, faculty, at the University of uh, Medicine, um, 
in the elevators, creating situations where there were performances. Uh, what would happen if you know if there's a pregnant woman stuck in an elevator? So they would go with no permission and do the you know <laughs> stuck an elevator with a pregnant woman and create a whole situation where the doctors or doctors say, I know what to do, and they would get into fights and you know show how ridiculous people are. React. He did things crazy things like that. Then he did something in a so in a in a soccer club, but in the in the area of the social club there was a, a huge Olympic swimming pool and they emptied that the swimming pool. It, it was a, a swimming pool for practice for for competition. So they had races and and they summoned up people and they started a performance inside of the swimming pool. And as the performance started, they opened the water. <laughs> So they flooded the actors, and the the performance was about the flooded people that were, you know, how they were sold land, and the audience was like, wait, 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 you know, it's, it, it, and they kept performing and they kept drowning. <laughs> so that was the La Inundación. Si, si, I remember. Which that. I, I wasn't part of that no. directly. I was tangentially part of it. Uh, I was. Like you know, like a student there. So, so you found this teacher, mm -hmm. yeah, a, a real character. Yeah. He he still is. I mean, he created. Then he got sick of everything, and he went to the National Insane Asylum, who was banned from being for being closed. He didn't go there as a patient. No, no, no. He went in, to start working. He went here. to work. Yeah. Okay. But he he does, he's not even a doctor. He could be. He could be. He could easily. <laughs> <But he, laughs> He, he was went as a teacher. He was confused. <laughs> <laughs> they tried to lock him in. But he created a theater there. And it's a theater that has international renown. Like, you know, they, they, they are called from France to go to Belgium festivals because it's amazing what they do. But he was an inspiration somehow oh, to definitely. both of you. Yeah, definitely. It was. And what was one of the projects you did together uh, with, with the, one of the projects inspired by Saba? We, uh, no, we didn't we have any, any not, not work together. together. Yeah. We were part of the subway somehow. Were you yes. part of the What's subway? What's the subway? Yes. I've heard about a little bit yes. about the subway With over Saba, the years. Yes, we, we did the this subway. year. We were part of So the subway was... One of the things that we detected is that the military you know, was in, instilling this fear and that one of the things that people were not doing is daring celebrate anything. In public, and we are, as you know, like Brazilians or Argentinians, or we, we are people of, you know, partying in the streets, and you know, like a lot of Latin Americans. So we we figure out there is this this thing about celebration. So what could we create in a public area that would bring uh, a shock? So one of the things, this, one of the, the actors that were part of the, the main group came up with the idea that what we need to celebrate is a wedding in a public space. And the, the chosen space was a subway. a subway. But the thing was, to, how do we set it up in order to make it happen without nobody noticing that it was happening until it was happening and then disappear us, move away without being caught? So the thing started with, in the first train station, there's this, this couple would come in, two actors, and debate that they don't have money and that they don't have the conditions to have a, a wedding, and get a coach, rally it up. And the second coach, in the second stop, would come a priest that would say, another actor say, well, everybody has the divine right to be married, and instill, you know, and people say, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> by the time that, you know, there were musicians coming in, <laughs> by, the time, by the time you get to the sixth or seventh stop, the, opens were, the doors would open, people were waiting in the stations, and instead of having a guy playing the violin in the, in, in the, in the platform, this, the music would come out of the, of the coach, and people were dancing, and it was just crazy, and it would keep going. And then... And people thought they were part of a wedding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 everybody thought it was a part of a wedding. And, and we did this in, in a bar, too. Yes. We make that yes. bar. Oh, I forgot about that. And we did that in, I in the street. I and, and also in the street. I was part of, mm. a, of a failed project that, that we tried to do it in a, in a mattress factory. <laughs> I, I want. No, I was. I, you was. Yes, uh, with my group. And we failed. We didn't, we didn't manage to get the workers somehow <laughs> rallied up. But, but it was interesting. Yeah, we did mm. it in a bar. So yeah. the, the, the thing on the train would... The wedding would happen, mm -hmm. and then what would happen? Would it just become a big ce celebration and yeah, performance? Yeah, celebration with the, with the people that was on the train. But weren't you afraid of getting caught? Yeah, I mean, how would yeah. It, of course. How would it end? That we, we were leaving the train slowly. 
like as everything started in the same way we were living in next station some of us left the the train and the next station so the others yeah. and the, the situation was like shh, so it would slowly disappear disappearing yeah, yeah. and right. you would just sort of just sort of leave right. and depart as if uh -huh. you had just been a part of right. not, not as an orchestrator right. or conductor uh -huh. and not repeat no. uh -huh. nor even say that you did that some places i think in the in the bar they left a car saying what you just saw was a performance mm -hmm. and then would you get back together in some location or is this just my imagination of how uh, you know it sounds like not not the same day no. normally you would wait a couple the of days next yeah and then the next two, day days, we have you, a meeting right because to talk about the experience one thing that you learn is that you know which you know was very similar to the experience that happened in algeria in 1957 against the french uh, the occupation the, is that you you, you operate in small units. So in order for the, the small unit not to be captured, you, what you need to do is, uh, which they are called cells, you don't go back to meet your folks. So if one of them is, is caught, you, you have time to get out. Or if you're caught, the other ones can run away. Right. Um, now I want to ask one question, and then uh, we're not going to get so far into the beyond part of this conversation today. But I'm interested and curious about, although you grew up in rural and urban places, although you in, in, in never necessarily consciously worked together to make a project, mm -hmm. both of you were very drawn in this extreme context to folk arts. I mean, to puppets, to, to folkloric popular traditions. Your performance, which was uh, a covert act that could have resulted in great violence happening to you, or a repetition of great violence, traumatic violence, that, that act was the staging of a wedding, which is uh, a very normal daily occurrence. I mean, I was just in Boston yesterday, and going through the public gardens, there were multiple weddings happening. Mm -hmm. So you were staging something that would seem almost mundane, but that was filled with, with meaning, and in some ways it was a, a folk tradition mm -hmm. that you were why the folk arts? Why do you think this coincidence of, of intention happened in this time where the violence was so palpable and so real and so, like, what you were doing was not to protect yourself from the violence in a certain way as if to sort of just walk a straight line. You went off the straight line and it o obeyed some, I'd say, at least radical mm -hmm. artistic impulses. In my, I think I, go, I was a little, ¿cómo se dice? Provocador. Yeah. Provocator. Provoca uh, provocator. <laughs> provocator. Uh, I, I, I was, uh, some, somehow I feel that I have to continue doing what I feel that I have to do, even in this situation. Because I continue, after this situation that I, when I was, uh, these few days, very bad treated and everything, I went back to schools to play theater, to play the same pieces that I play before. I didn't change my message. I didn't do another thing. I continue working, visiting schools, fighting with the directors of the schools because they didn't want to have these messages. And I was insisting that that's what we do. And uh, it, was, it went like that for years. And uh, in, in retrospect, do either of you see the, the <coughs> Um, the gravitation towards folk art with any new um, perspective? Now that... In, Today? In, yeah, looking back, like, why the folk arts? Why puppetry? Why... I think it's, you know, like everything, it's a complex... Um, there's not one answer, one single answer. I think that, that uh, I identify with Jorge in the sense that, you know, I am also a provocator or provocateur. Um, I was very angry at what was going on, and still am. Um, and I, I did believe that change, and I do believe that change is possible. Also, my family is, is a dysfunctional family. And, uh, or, I don't know if it's, it's, it's uh, fair to call that, but uh, we had a, a lot of Mine burns. is a great family. <laughs> 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 Liar. <laughs> you are such a liar. <laughs> but I think uh, uh, there is a, there is there is a um, 
<laughs> I understood or I believed and I still believe that there are there are uh, things that we're talking now here um, that there are happening are happening in a in a in small ways in the nucleus of the of the groups in the families in the in the friendships that there is a certain S and M going on that is not a, is not fun right that is not for pleasure or for play is it could be a real thing violent like it happened in the Weimar Republic right um, I think that 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 I I was drawn to see what was going on because of my family, um, because of myself, what was going on with other people. And in that I discover roots of behavior. Or uh, Then I started looking into history. You know, I, I was very passionate about the, uh, the, uh, the Aborigines history and the, the European history in this part and how you know, acts of violence get repeated systematically, you know, the, as the Inquisition was happening, they were invading, brutalizing the Inca Empire, which were not saints. They were not angels, so the Incas. There was sort of a going to a source. Yes. You mm -hmm. both were led to a similar source to there, a, mm -hmm. to, in response to violence. To a root. Mm -hmm. yes. To a root, both a root of maybe a, his, a history of, of it, but also there was a need for people to uh, celebrate together mm -hmm. in response to violence, yeah. uh, or a response to, uh, or uh, of of rejoining to story, which I think that the, as you said, the puppets were were important because they they held stories. They could mm -hmm. hold the stories, the texts that you couldn't necessarily find mm -hmm. for that that specific period of time. Well, and you know, interestingly enough, with years, I, I brought an, an anthropologist to see one of his memories, Dreams and Illusions performance, which was about that period. And uh, and the guy said, he was crying when the, the, the performance finished and he came to me, he said, you can do this because you're using puppets. Because nobody would be mm -hmm. able to talk about this so mm -hmm. close. Mm -hmm to what happened three years ago mm -hmm. if you weren't using, and he called it that the terminology in that field was a cold, impersonal chamber. The puppet mm -hmm. creates a world that is impersonal, it's not personal, yet it's intimate, mm -hmm. and it's like a chamber. It allows us to be in a chamber together. And it's a metaphor, you know? You, yes. you pu Puppet theater and, and the, the play with puppets and objects it allowed you to, to work with metaphors and, and to say things that you with an actor probably couldn't say or right. couldn't do. And that's why I choose after that period almost completely puppet theater as my way of expression. Since uh, then the, the democracy came back to uh, the possibility to have a, an, an elected president and everything came back in the beginning of the 80s and uh, I continue working only with puppets because I think that I have many things that I could say with this technique. Right. And, uh, and uh, I, I start always, and uh, uh, up to now, I'm working in, in a mixture of uh, political, social, artistic projects. Uh, because I, uh, then I start with this, uh, work in the in the neighborhoods taking young people to make a group of puppeteers uh, that we had for uh, uh, quite long time all the 80s in my town until I moved to Europe and I was trying to to make a, a, a most the most professional puppet theater I could with these young boys and girls that came from the most poor uh, neighborhoods in the in the city and around also in the in the not como se dice la parte no urbana in the in the country in the, in the suburbs, huh? yeah. in the suburbs. and um, but then i was tired after a few years of this fight and trying to to do this work this social work i was tired i i have the feeling that i was 28 and I had the feeling that I'm, I'm losing my time not working in the, so as deep as I needed in the um, artistic creation. 
I was too much engaged in the social problematic and I didn't have the time and the energy to go deeper right. in real puppet and theater uh, in, uh, as, as I needed. And, and this is now, we're now in the 80s. At the end of the 80s. At the end of the 80s. So a end of I want to try and do two things at once. Mm -hmm. One is uh, bring everyone up to the 80s now. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go back also for a second. I'm faster. I'm already in the 90s. No, no, we have to be very <laughs> wily with our time right now. Uh, I want to also stop and I'm going to try and do four things. One is I want to go back for a second and try and make some sort of thematic point about folk arts and the puppetry. Then I want to do something about bringing people up to speed about the 80s and what happened in between, and then perhaps take some questions about what we did before that. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is, um, and I don't know, this is, there's something interesting about visible and invisible, mm. that the puppets make something that's invisible, or puppetry, not the puppets, <laughs> it makes them seem like they're their own faction, like, it um, doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> Uh, that, that they are bringing something that is invisible to light, that we can't see or we can't hear or we can't say. Um, the, the, the celebration on the train is also bringing something and making it visible that was not allowed or couldn't be seen or felt. And then in both cases, there's a process of making them invisible again so no one gets in trouble. Mm -hmm. You disappear it. You disappear yourselves mm -hmm. in a way. And the army or the military is doing something very similar, where they're also trying to disappear people and make them invisible mm -hmm. and, and take neutralize but their for effect. very different reasons. For, di <laughs> for different reasons, but throughout the this, these periods of time, there there is this um, there's all this weight, there's all this struggle around how do you make the invisible visible and how do you make the visible invisible in lots of different ways, mm -hmm. in sort of a prism way. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's interesting, and it continues in both of your work, I want to say, later on. Um, that was point one. Part two is sort of to, to jump out of the, the period of the, the, the war, and we talked about this this morning, but both Carlos and Jorge were extremely ambitious coming out of the, the end of the 70s and the early 80s after doing this resistance work through mm -hmm. art. Um, and they both have said today um, that they, their work was multifaceted and that it was artistic and also a social work and a work around collective action and a work around collective thinking mm -hmm. and political, and in your case, Carlos, even economic as you wanted to research capitalism. Well, that was later, yeah. Later, okay. So in some ways, the, the war, let's say for all intents and purposes came to an end, although it didn't, but democracy was so, sort of restored in 83 with another presidential mm -hmm. election. You had already established the movement of popular theater in the region of Rio Plata. Yeah. Um, uh, you had also already established another organization, and then um, this, uh, this group in 83 Nasse? Nas. 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 And you talked about having witnessed the work of Nas. Mm -hmm. And what was Nas in 1983, where democracy is being restored? Mm -hmm. What was Nas? Very briefly. As an, uh, as an, oh, as an uh, spectator, I have to say that was an amazing experience to see this young group of actors uh, with so many abilities, you know, so, so many good things on stage. I mean, they could sing, they could act, they could play amazing with puppet theater. And, uh, and with this message so strong, so concrete on stage, you know, it was like a, 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 a wind, a fresh wind on, on, on theater, in Argentinian theater. When I saw that, I said, okay, now, now we have a really a new fresh wind in, on, on stages. And this was an early version of, and maybe a more expansive version, of what ended up being Diablo Mundo. Yeah. yeah. So Diablo Mundo yeah. sort of officially becomes Diablo Mundo in 85. And was the continuation of the uh, uh, the largest group of that group that researched this, the circus, the gaucho, mm. did NAS, and then a smaller group did Diablo Mundo. So it's three stages of the same story. Right, and you and your brother, Roberto, were sort of yeah. primary leaders of NAS, bringing yeah. together all sorts of artists 
to incorporate and collaborate. Yeah. And perhaps in a more robust, galvanized way now that so democracy was sort of happening. Yeah. We were, we were less, well, I wasn't really scared because the groups were still operating somehow. But there's some momentum. But there was momentum. There was a little bit of freedom. And uh, we went out for the first time in the open. In so the president took the 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 government took uh, the house uh, the the democratic government the December tenth, nineteen eighty three, and we went out in the main downtown street, Florida, and performed with costumes and everything without telling anybody, without making any advertising, uh, December 19th, we went out and we performed. And this is the first time we were able to perform somehow like that. And it must have been, well, it sounds like it was... It was amazing. Yeah. It was amazing because people were like, some people reacted, of course. So there was some violent reactions from, because, there, you, you know, society has everything. And if you're out in the public, in the, in the streets, you will find everybody. So there were people screaming at us. There were people like crying. There were people, you know. Kind of it was a party in that moment. It was a party. It was a party. It was a party. We, and we, a, a month. Party. A month. People were so happy in yeah. the streets. Yeah. So coming out of this period of time, there was this ambition, I think, in, on both of your parts to organize and to create. There was some movement going. Mm -hmm. There was momentum, even if there was still the fear, the reality of the even though there was democracy, there was still repression. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'd like to stop for a second and see if there's a quick question about this. And then what I'm going to do is try and show a glimpse of both of the work, uh, just very short excerpts, um, as a way of taking us closer to the present before we um, stop. We take a meaning for the commercial. Yes. Yes, yes. would you like me to introduce you? Um, well, I would, I want to say a couple of things, so it's not quite so much of a question. Okay. Um, it, I always am astonished at your courage, um, both of you, and I just wanted to say that. Um, I think that a voice is the only thing that human beings have um, to fight destruction. And whatever the destruction is in the moment, and it seems like we're destined to be fighting destruction all the time. You had a voice then, and you continue to have a voice. So you are part of the creation and not the destruction. Um, I, I was thinking during, while you were talking, um, that, that it's always astonishing to us that people were creating art during the Holocaust. And it's the same thing. We, we only have our voice, so we're not disappeared if we have our voice and keep having our voice. Um, so I really appreciate also that you are willing to share your voice today because I know it's a very difficult thing to share beyond the art, just the words of what happened. Thank you. Any other questions or, or comments about this chapter? Basha. I appreciated your question about to Jorge about um, about folk uh, tradition and the puppetry and celebration and public space and it made in the face of historical political violence in society and it made me think of the work and thinking of a Russian uh, thinker philosopher of culture Mikhail Bakhtin I don't know if you're familiar with me Mikhail Bakhtin and his work, his concept of the carnivalesque, of the carnival. And for him, it was a cultural uh, um, concept that he uh, derived from literature and uh, saw in literature. But you can transfer it to, to theater situation. 
So the carnivalesque, in the face, Mikhail Bakhtin lived in Soviet Russia under incredible oppression, cultural oppression. And his response to, uh, to political violence and cultural oppression was through um, this idea of carnivalesque and dialogue. So the carnivalesque would be a reversal of, 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 his, of uh, repressive hierarchies. And he traced this uh, to the history of medieval carnival in Europe, where it would happen, the folk culture had the, uh, the celebration in the town square, in the center, one day a year, and the, where the, there's a crowning of the fool, and the king is, becomes the fool, and the fool becomes the king. And it was symbolically uh, an act performance in the public square, where those oppressive, hierarchies are reversed. Yeah. It's, it's interesting for all those that are studying the, the combination between Carnaval and Comedia del Arte, the, the relationship, how Comedia was born and puppets out of Carnaval and what Carnaval started around the year 1000 or a little earlier, which is by the end of the Roman Empire and the beginning of the, of the church. It is a response to some church, but there is something very important at the time that I think triggers some of these things, be, be, besides the repression, is the idea of the apocalypse coming right then. There's one of the, one of the major um, feeders of, the, of, the, of this manifestation is, is the, the end, the idea of the end. You mean in Latin America, the carnival? In Europe, started in, in the year 900 or 1000. And we took it from Europe. I'm not sure if that was part of Bakhtin's thinking about the carnival. You may be right, I don't know. I'm just saying, historically, I mean, we could research that. It is interesting. Thank you for that, uh, Basha. That's great. And I think, do we have? Yeah, we have a couple questions from, from online. Our online. Um, mm -hmm. The first from. Yes, well. uh, factories. Oh and yes, yes, of course. In the last, uh, during the nineties in Argentina, we have a, um, a, a, so, something hap terrible happened that we, most of the the um, fabrics and industries uh, went down. Factories. Factories. So they uh, then uh, in the beginning of the two th year 2000, 2002, more or less, the um, the workers try to continue with the fabric, the factory, the factories. I don't know. I, I sorry. No, I have a bad day with English today. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and they they start a big movement in the country trying to continue with this uh, with with their works. I mean, and uh, they did. And some uh, theater groups helps 
uh, them a lot, artists in general, not only theater groups. We have a great painter in Neuquén called uh, Marta Such, which is a, a, a great, great, great painter, and she has been working with these people very, very near. And uh, many um, musicians Musician, and actors yes. and that went to, to support them in this fight. So I think uh, it's, a, it's a very brave uh, people and they, they have done something that is amazing because this government, during the last 10 years, they help a lot these projects about the, the workers taking uh, the, the la fuente de trabajo, ¿cómo se llama? The source, the, the source, or the the, the, huh? the work source, or the, the means but means uh -huh. of uh, production. Yeah. Great. Yes. Um, I'd like to now um, share a little bit of the work uh, that Carlos and Diablo Mundo and Jorge and Periferico uh, did in this period of time between '83 when democracy was restored. I say that with some quotations or some understanding that it, it wasn't a clean anything um, until the, the mid-90s, um, this, this, this chapter of work. Uh, first, I'd like to show something of, of Diablo Mundo. Do you know what we're seeing? I think so. And I think it's created with a group of people. David Burin was part of that that we were already, before the 90s, we were already working with cooperative of workers. So this video is a cooperative of workers that are of uh, media mm -hmm. that came to do this video. If that's the one I'm thinking about. It's, it's the one you showed me, right? Yes. Yes, so, yeah, so then that, that's, and I'm still working with that one. Uh, it's like a, it was like a, a presentation of Diablo Mundo. Uh, I don't know if it has a name. Um, the piece is probably Memories, Dreams, and Illusion. But there is a, a documentary about Diablo Mundo and, a, and our little warehouse.
Carlos, can you just say um, just a word about that? Yeah, that was, um, I thought it was going to be a, a different part, but that's, uh, that was El Fuego, the fire, and uh, it was part of a long, so all this work has had an arc that transcended all these periods that we were talking about. So we started in, in researching and living with indigenous communities. This is a combination of pop book, which is a, the sacred book written by the Mayan culture and some of the Latin American, uh, Argentinian stories and people that we met in, in, Ar in Argentina. Uh, and it was, it was the story of, it's a mythology similar with, to any mythology is a, and, and it talks about a sub, uh, subversion of a tribe uh, against their gods. So it was very, I mean, it talked about the same thing. Um, and now we're going to see uh, a couple of short clips from, and what year was that, Carlos? That started in 85, but it, what Jorge saw at that time with Nas was the, the previous one was a, a chain. So we started in 83, presenting the other one, and this, this uh, was premiered in Balcarce in April 1985, I believe. Yeah, it was April 1985. So Diablo Mundo was working prolifically from this period of time into the 90s, into the mid 90s and, and beyond, but definitely this is a very rich time. Um, Jorge, after doing a lot of social organizing in, in Cipolletti and organizing and trying to teach young puppets, ended up going to Europe and uh, working with a, a, a master of puppetry um, and then coming back and working with this group Periferico and much of the theme of this work now by the mid 90s, early mid 90s is about the disillusionment after a, after a decade of, of quote unquote democracy and of having voice there was uh, a real um, visceral and palpable sense of disappointment in what was happening and I, I think that's important as we look at uh, a few clips from uh, Machina Hamlet, Hamlet Machine, which it's, is, yeah. It's a piece, that, that's, it's based on a piece of Heine Müller, the, the, the great uh, dramaturg from Germany. And uh, it was, a, you know, the, the piece of Müller is only three pages. Yeah. It's almost nothing in words. But the, what, what, what is in these three pages is incredible. So what you're going to see is just a little bit of this uh, project that has to do with violence uh, as, as a way of uh, relation in a society. What we are talking about this is in this show is uh, how all what happened before uh, the militars and the democracy, the, the Weak, the weak democracy that came after and everything put us in this situation where the media has the power of uh, and, uh, and uh, tell us how to live uh, as a society. Uh, so I don't know if this piece tells exactly what I tell but Again, it's not conspiracy theory. It, we could be really scientific about observing social uh, occurrences. Um, Henrik Müller wrote that in 1980 in Germany. So that's 40 years 
after the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And he's still talking about this society mm -hmm. having this violence program. Mm -hmm. And Periferico starts this in... 95. In 1995, yeah. only 15 Two years, years after, after he wrote the, the piece. Yes, and, and after our own, I would say, tragedy, or however, mm -hmm. dirty war, that's mm -hmm. the name, the technical war. Uh, it's not Holocaust, it's dirty war. Which I think there are lines and there are similarities that we can establish all over the world. We're talking about this, these two countries, but it, we could look e even further. And if I have a, a moment, I want to say, can I say something, one more thing? Yeah. Um, today, Matthew was asking me about repression. You know, how does it feel and what happens? And, and I had this memory or the, uh, that I had read and again, you know, it's, everything is up for research, not up for grab, but we should research these things if we are inclined to do so. Um, the, the Nazis in Germany took the model of the American repression of the Indians. That's what I read. Uh, then, According to what I understood and what I read is that the creation of the concentration camp was to hide from the German people that they were doing that because they wouldn't have enough consensus. After, after the, the Holocaust, the world knew that that didn't work. So how are we going to repress now? And this is when they came up with the idea of disappearing people. So there is a continuity and there is a research that is being done of how to repress. And I think that, you know, Michel Foucault, which is a, a thinker in, in France, described this, that the best way to repress and the way that it was being used in the 70s and after was to instill fear by operations like this that were very meticulous, and very specific, and very surgical. So a particular kind of performance yeah. by the state. Right. Okay. Yes. Here we go. Sorry, it's too dark.
can see now. You can see it's too dark here. Too dark to see it here. Well, that, the, the, the scene is, uh, is in a, in a uh, try to show in, the, in a cinema, it's a, it's a, how do you say pantalla? A screen. It's a screen. And uh, in the screen, you have all the information that the media sends about the terrible things that are happening in the world, violence all the time, different situations of violence. And uh, you can see images from different uh, uh, news channels that send this information. And this is a cinema with all this, like you are sitting, uh, it's, it's a mixture of puppets and actors. And suddenly the actors, which has masks exactly as the puppets, start to bite people. And it starts a, 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 like a war, you know? They start to kill them one by one and put all the bodies in, at the side of the cinema. And then they just left. Uh, the, the, the idea was to show, it, it's a, it was a very violent, uh, violent uh, show. And what we were trying to tell is that we are dominated by violence. It's, it's the sign of our time and uh, of, this, of this period of the humanity and that um, we are driven by, by this force. And uh, well, it's not very funny in English, <laughs> but it was a great show, actually. Yeah, it was great. It was amazing. Um, we didn't obviously get to cover all of the ground. I wanted to, or, but I think it's, um, there's, there's a lot more. Um, the work that's continued uh, over the last two decades is really noteworthy. There's been other forms of, of crisis in Argentina, mm -hmm. economic crises, um, where other models of, of, of adaptability, other modes of production, artistic production, and community organization have emerged that are really noteworthy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think obviously the work that you've done here, Carlos, um, that are around the autonomy of the, the artist, um, engaging the community. Uh, our first summer spectacle ended with a, a song from, from the Argentine uh, Carnival. Um, and so this these these this response to this historical moment, the 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 drive to create a meaningful culture has continued to evolve in really fascinating ways. Both of you now with your own centers mm -hmm. on different mm -hmm. parts of mm -hmm. the hemisphere mm -hmm. um, are really great models, and I hope we can talk about these things in the future at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm I'm grateful for the for this conversation. I have something. Yes. To show, can I? Yeah. Yes. Is, yes. Please. Is it going to be dark like that? Or? No. 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 Okay. Then it's going to be for real. Please. <laughs> yes. Show it. Can you move there? Yeah. You know, I think I was thinking right now when you try to show what you have done before, mm -hmm. it always looked dark. <laughs> always. Uh, when you told about your past, it used to sound dark. Um, and the, the reality is that we, to found the truth, usually we, we have to, to look in the garbage. Most of the truth is in the garbage. And uh, it's a very interesting place to, to go, even if it's dirty. Sometimes the memories are dirty, sometimes not, or it's a mixture of it. Uh, sometimes we found in the garbage what we really are, because our life is made by things that we put in a garbage bag. Uh, and I have something in my garbage bag. <laughs> and what I have is what now nowadays is my truth.
what am I doing here? Where am I? Who are you old people? What am I doing here? Mama? 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 Oh, I'm only eight years old. What am I doing? Just one single memory from my past. You, you, come here. Uh, I got this memory. For you. I gotta go back again. Mama? Mama? Where are you? My brother, <laughs> Roberto playing a long time ago. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Please join us for some coffee, tea, whatever's left. Thank you for being here. If you're online, uh, thank you for, for watching. Sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions. Feel free to email them, um, and you can connect online about emailing your questions or continuing this conversation in other ways. Um, and again, thank you to the HowlRound at Arts Emerson. Thank you to National Performance Network. Um, and have a good day. Please, Preston, sorry. First, uh, I want to thank Carlos and Jorge and Matthew for this wonderfully uh, important, I mean, this wonderfully entertaining and important uh, presentation, dialogue, and I'm pleased to have been a member of the audience. I just want to let you know that Kate Doyle, who has spent many years at the National Archives in Washington, who has done research on the dirty war in Argentina and whose research and reporting on the scorched earth policy against the uh, indigenous people of Guatemala during the 80s. And it was truly a genocide against the indigenous people. Well, her reporting uh, has contributed greatly to the uh, to the verdict against uh, Rios Montt, the president of Guatemala, that, uh, for genocide that led to his conviction. Kate Doyle is going to be at Wellspring House, a retreat center that I operate up the street for the month of July, and I've arranged for her to speak one evening at uh, St. John's Church, which is up the street. So I just wanted you to know you'll have a chance to hear from uh, Kate Doyle, this archivist who has really spent years studying about the crimes and atrocities of right-wing governments in the uh, Western Hemisphere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, if any one of you want to see this wonderful puppet, it's one of the puppets I, with my group, we have done a group of old guys and women, women and men that they are part of a show that we are working in. And uh, her name is Rosita. And uh, it's a puppet made by an amazing constructor that we have in the group called Silvina. And um, it's a story about memories. Uh, old people uh, in, a, in a hospital die and uh, having fun together. <laughs> and um, it's a very well done puppet. Have many, many great possibilities for manipulation. Uh, we are still developing some of them for the movements, but it's amazing what she can, she can do, you know? She doesn't need a walk. No, no, she don't. She works perfectly. And uh, if, if you want to try, if you want to try her, move her, just do it. And if you need some help, I can do it. Hmm? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.